Welcome back 2021ers. I hope that you're all doing well as we move past assembly and towards a new topic, which is going to comprise our lowest dip yet towards computer architecture. And that will be a discussion of the basic hardware that comprises the CPU and the rest of those computing systems that we've been touching through programming up to this point, but are now going to expect, uh, experience a little bit more directly. Just to give you a prize to the overall uh, flow of what's happening in the next uh, few weeks, uh, you'll want to be having a look at Brighton Halloran Chapter 4. Uh, unlike previous chapters, though, I'm going to authorize the practice of skimming on this one. And part of this is that that Chapter 4 is quite dense uh, and comprises almost a whole summer course that the textbook authors have been known to teach at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, rather than do the stuff that's in that chapter during a normal semester, they pull it out and uh, to offer it as an optional sort of enrichment course uh, to students of great interest. That should give you some idea of the depth that is present in there and the many, many details that they attend to, uh, which are a bit beyond the scope of what I think of as important for practicing computer scientists. Anyway. Um, so be having a look there, though, because we'll touch on aspects that they discuss and complement them in various ways. Uh, the next chapter you want to start having a look at in more detail is Chapter 6 on the memory system, and we'll spend a considerable amount of time there as well. Uh, in terms of upcoming deliverables, uh, next week we'll post Homework 9, and this will be interesting in that it's the first time maybe some of you will have an, a chance to actually time the code that you run, uh, and we'll be making use of a little time utility there. We'll start to demonstrate how that looks uh, later on, uh, not today, but in the next lecture probably, uh, as we survey uh, Homework 9. Uh, we'll observe some strange results in terms of timing there that seem to defy reason until you begin to understand and some of the underlying architecture and features of how CPUs actually work. And so look for explanations for what's going on in terms of those timings uh, to come from our discussion and lecture. Uh, and I also owe you uh, another assignment, Project 4, uh, will be posted relatively soon and will comprise an optimization and performance study uh, um, sort of matter. Uh, the knowledge that you will acquire in studying architecture and studying the next topic, uh, the memory hierarchy, this will come in handy to improve the speed and also explain the execution of some of the codes that you'll be both writing and examining in that project. So then, let us move ahead and actually begin discussion of the content here. Uh, up to this point, we have discussed various things concerning computing, but it bears repeating that humans are very fine computers in their own right. Uh, they can execute algorithms, uh, perform complex tasks. Uh, there are various things that we are extremely good at computing. Uh, but when it comes to hard number crunching, uh, we are slow and error prone. And generally, as humans are wont to do, things that we're bad at, uh, that we invent tools and machines uh, that can do these things faster, better, more effectively, and so forth. Uh, and a variety of machines have been built in history that are fairly good at this number crunching bit, that build upon our own human intellect uh, and take the mechanical parts, uh, make them faster and more accurate uh, than what we can do by hand in typical ways. Uh, so the following uh, discussion that we're going to have is a discussion of that sort of high level uh, to low level um, um, portion of stuff. We have studied uh, C programming that's in the middle of this sort of abstraction um, descent from humanness uh, to things that are more machine-like. We've also then taken a step down to assembly code uh, and even touched on the fact that assembly code itself is not directly interpretable by a CPU, that it's only after that assembly is formed into bits, these binary opcodes, uh, that the processor can actually start to process and perform tasks associated with them. Uh, it's at the point now that we'd want to come to understand uh, the binary opcodes. How is it that you can construct a machine that will understand and do things based on that? Uh, preserve state and crunch numbers, more or less. Uh, and to that end, we'll need to start talking a little bit more about hardware design. Uh, for instance, uh, VHDL, a hardware design language. Uh, and actually talk about wires, gates, electrons, and so forth as you move ahead. That journey starts uh, with a somewhat abstract concept to begin with. Uh, and that is uh, the notion of a logic gate. 
Uh, this is an abstract physical device, but we'll need actual physical devices that perform the tasks that you're familiar with there. Uh, just to survey quick, most of you are aware of logical operations like OR, uh, where you have two inputs like an A and a B, and one comes out uh, is in some way uh, uh, related to what the two inputs are in their relationships. Uh, most commonly, we see this as single true and false values. Uh, so a true comes in for A, a false comes in for B, and what comes out of the OR gate in this case, or OR operation, uh, is a true, because you only need one true, either A or B, uh, in order for the output to become true. Uh, to that end, then you're probably acquainted also with the AND operation, uh, the NOT operation. Uh, we've touched on this XOR operation as we've looked at bitwise operations in C, as in if either A or B are exclusively true, uh, then the output is true. But if both A and B are 1 uh, or true, uh, or both A and B are 0, uh, false, uh, then what comes out of an XOR is a false E value. Uh, in addition to that, you'll notice down here that there are some variants instead of an OR, a NOR gate, and you know that by the little nub here, uh, known as an inversion, uh, and so to a NAND gate, uh, which is an inversion of an AND gate. Uh, the NOT gate uh, itself has this little nub on it, and unlike the rest of these, is a single input, uh, but putting a little nub here on these things, um, it tends to, in the notation used by electrical folks, uh, to invert the results of the gate. Uh, so if A and B are 1 and 1, uh, then normally what would come out of an AND gate is a 1 true. Uh, what comes out of an AND gate is false. If I had a 0 or 1 or a 1 0 uh, or a 0 0, what would normally come out of the AND gate is uh, false, but what's going to come out of an AND gate is true. Um, so these things are an abstraction, as in there's the notion of an OR gate, uh, that two things come in and it performs some sort of operation uh, that causes one thing to come out, and that one thing is equivalent in whatever way to the OR logical operation. Now, these things are only useful if you can actually build physical implementations of them, uh, and there are a variety of them that have been used uh, throughout history, particularly associated with computing. Uh, the most recent innovation that uh, implements these gates is the transistor, and this isn't a physics and electronics class, uh, so we aren't going to delve into exactly what a transistor is or the various kinds of them that exist, uh, but know that using this physical technology, transistors, you can build gates of various kinds here and that to build an OR gate or a NOR gate or a NAND gate, it takes a certain number of transistors. Uh, if you go backwards a little bit in time, you'll see that earlier versions of computers made use of a more primitive technology, vacuum tubes to uh, construct gates together. Uh, and preceding that, there were mechanical devices. Uh, for instance, uh, the earliest computers didn't involve electricity, but cogs and wheels uh, that involve uh, you turning a crank in order to get the computation to work right. Now what consists uh, of true and false in each of these cases is a little bit varied. Uh, for instance, in the electrical setting, usually a true is a high voltage and a false is a low voltage. And there's some cutoff in between uh, that discretizes this uh, so that as you would see something above this threshold, it's considered true and below this threshold, it's considered false. Mechanical devices would certainly need to be used something else for that. Uh, and if you're nerdy enough uh, and are willing to click on the link, uh, you can examine the water pressure computers uh, that the fine folks at MIT have screwed around with. And in that case, it would be a high pressure for water that would indicate a true, and a low pressure or lack of flow of water that would indicate a false. Uh, that form of computing is not exactly miniaturizable uh, very well, uh, and it's rather wet as computation devices come. Uh, so typical devices like your phones and your desktops and your laptop computers, they favor transistors uh, these days because they can be made to be so very tiny uh, and still carry enough voltage to compute trues and falses uh, in a myriad of ways. The smaller that you can make something, and usually the faster it can become, uh, the more convenient it is to hold in the palm of your hand, and to some extent, uh, the more efficient it becomes in terms of power usage. Uh, but those physical implementations all have some sort of trade-offs associated with them, uh, either ease of construction uh, or other properties such as power usage. 
And it's only in the modern era that we've discovered and invented technologies that can make transistors as small as they are. Uh, preceding that, uh, the stuff had to be done by hand, and you were not able to work at this uh, sort of tiny micro level uh, that we're at these days. Uh, so that ends, the kinds of things that you can construct with gates then are somewhat universal. Uh, that by stringing together electrical components of these gates and wires between them, or if you had a water-based computer, uh, tubes uh, that water would go through uh, and pressure valves uh, that would detect those uh, pressure. Uh, stringing these together, uh, you can form gates and then a notion of a circuit. We'll start a discussion with this uh, with something that's known as a combinatorial, a combinatorial circuit. It's actually a class of circuits that you construct in a certain way uh, so as to make them stateless. That irrespective of what's happened in the past, if you change the inputs uh, on it, then the outputs change in accordance with that. This isn't particularly useful, uh, but it's a good starting point. And uh, one reason to begin there is to get the basics under the uh, um, uh, under your belt. And uh, another good reason is that the kinds of Boolean functions you might study, uh, for instance, in CSI 2011, uh, discrete math and discrete structures course, uh, they are reflected very well and can be implemented physically uh, using combinatorial circuits uh, only. That you set the inputs to be trues and falses or zeros and ones, uh, and after a mild delay, uh, you get outputs that reflect what the circuit has computed. Uh, now, some obvious candidates here uh, are the direct Boolean functions that you're familiar with. An AND would be easily implemented with an AND gate, an OR uh, implemented with an OR gate, and so on. Uh, these are very, very obvious, uh, and it only becomes somewhat more interesting when you try to compute more complex stuff like arithmetic. We'll get there in just a moment. Uh, for now, though, consider the following combinatorial circuit. Uh, and as a brief exercise and review, uh, you'd want to uh, examine the gates that are strung together here and compute the truth table of if I have a 1 and a 1 and a 0 that goes into this circuit, what's going to come out of this output over here? It shouldn't concern you too much uh, that there's an OR gate on here that has three things coming into it. In just about every case, if you have multiple inputs uh, beyond two, then you can usually string several gates together, in this case two OR gates together, in order to uh, emulate this sort of three input OR gates uh, using uh, two two input OR gates. Uh, we can look at that again in the answer in just a moment. Uh, but for the moment, take a, a, a bit of time and just fill in so that you're on track here the truth table for this thing, for the various inputs, all the combinations of A, B, and Cs, and the ones and zeros, trues and falses that they could be. What is the output over here? Uh, after that construction phase, examine it and just speculate on what is the meaning at a higher level of this circuit? What is it computing? How do the inputs at a high level relate to the outputs? Take a moment, uh, chat yourself up or chat a neighbor up uh, and determine those things. All right, that's probably enough time if you pause the video uh, to examine this. Uh, I need to make this a little smaller so I can copy this table. Uh, sometimes this doesn't work very well, so I might have to jump over uh, someplace else. Uh, and just give me a little org file here that'll uh, lay this thing out. Oh, crap. Okay, so it copied terribly. Uh, and you can see uh, copying things from PDFs uh, never works uh, tremendously well. Uh, so instead, I'm going to find this in my source file. So example, combinatorial circuit. Cool. There we go. Uh, so I'll grab this little table down here, and so as not to disrupt this slide for future uh, students, uh, here's our table over here. Uh, and I can get these two side by side uh, and examine here uh, for an input of A and B and C of all zeros. All of the ands here are going to produce outputs of zeros, uh, and those zeros falses are going to come along here and be all ORed together uh, to get yet another zero. And so here we'll have an output of zero. Uh, any single uh, one output here, you'll see that if I have a single A, that's a one, uh, then I'll still get uh, all of these AND gates kicking out uh, zeros here uh, because I need both two of these things, uh, both A and B, in order to get even a single one to come out of this thing. Uh, so to that end, uh, any place I see a single one here, uh, that's a C of one, that'll still be a zero, uh, a B of one, that's still a zero, and an A of one, that's still a zero. Uh, so that rules those out. 
Now, if I see an A and a B as a one, uh, then what's gonna go into this AND gate is a one, and what comes out of here is a one. Uh, and to that end, the one is gonna get combined with uh, any other values from this OR, but the generalization of a multi-way OR gate that you'd see if you stuck two ORs together to emulate it, uh, is that if any single input is a one, uh, then what comes out is a one. So for two inputs here, uh, A and B true, uh, then I would get a true output. So I'd fill that entry in down here, the one. Uh, for B and C true, uh, then the two inputs here would be a one. Uh, I might get uh, zeros coming out of here, uh, but I would definitely still get a one coming out of out there. Uh, so that's B and C here. Uh, and then for A and C, uh, this last point, uh, still I have an A uh, and a C here, those two inputs are fed into this middle AND gate, a one comes out, and I'll have a one coming out of out here. Uh, the only thing that remains then is what about for all three ones, and then I have, in that case, a one, a one, and a one, and that's a whole lot of ones uh, to feed this out, uh, so there's a one here as well. Uh, to that end, half of my inputs, or half of my outputs here are ones, half are zeros. And the pattern that I think is worthwhile to point out here uh, is that this is essentially a majority circuit. It's sort of a voting circuit uh, that if the majority of the inputs are one, then what comes out of this is a one. Uh, versus if the majority are zeros, uh, then what comes out in terms of the output is a zero. Uh, to that end, this is a non-trivial circuit that if someone just asked you, hey, construct a voting circuit where I have three inputs and what comes out uh, is uh, either a one if two or three of the inputs are one uh, and a zero otherwise, uh, then it might take you a little bit of work to construct something that looks sort of like this. Voting circuits in general, uh, I don't know of practical uses for them out there in the real computing world, but uh, there may actually be some. Uh, and in fact, if you look hard enough, you might see something like that in the assembly level languages, uh, which states for this 16 or 32 bit quantity, uh, set something to be one if the majority of the bits in that register are one uh, and zero otherwise if the majority are not one. Uh, I don't know that for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if such a thing showed up in something like the x86-64 uh, instruction set. Uh, so on that front, uh, aside from demonstrating the fact that you can construct sort of non-trivial computations of a sort uh, using this uh, output, uh, this is also a demonstration then of uh, ways that you can string uh, gates and wires together in order to compute some sort of an output value. That reflects uh, some Boolean logic uh, that you could describe, not just with gates, but uh, mathematically as well. The next obvious question then uh, is to look uh, for just a moment at these circuits and determine which, uh, sorry, some properties of circuits and what makes them good or bad in that respect. Uh, now you have to take my word for it, but at the top here is this A majority circuit, and beneath it is a B majority circuit, which has an identical uh, truth table. And that this thing down here, despite looking somewhat different from the majority circuit on top, uh, it actually performs the same computation and spits out if A, B, and, uh, a and B are true, then what comes out is true. If A and C are true, what comes out is true. Uh, but if only C is true, then I get uh, the majority is a zero. So that's what's uh, spit out here. Uh, to that end, it's natural to want to compare these two to say which is the better circuit. If they do the same thing, which of them would be preferred if you were actually laying this down in hardware, uh, using either components that you had to buy off the shelf or using some technology that's going to etch this into a wafer of silicon? Take a moment, consider the different criteria that you might evaluate these circuits on, and according to that criteria, is it A that's favored or B that's favored? You should be able to come up with at least several different criteria on which you could judge circuits. And it may be that, for, according to some measures, uh, this A version is better, uh, but down here this B version is better according to some other measures. Take just a moment, consider this, and then we'll move ahead with that discussion. Now, right. uh, if you didn't pause, you can do so now, but spoiler alert, uh, here are some of the criteria that I would think of as important to judge these circuits. So the first thing that might stand out to you uh, is the number of gates that are used up here. And I'll call that a gate count, it's this middle criteria over here. 
Now this is a, a little bit of a, 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 a mismatch because uh, up here we already said there probably isn't a three input OR gate that's directly available, uh, but uh, there probably is some way to sort of count on that. But for the moment, for, just for simplicity, we'll say there are four gates up here, about two, three two input AND gates and uh, a three input OR gate. If you wanted to, uh, for instance, uh, make this uh, a little bit fairer, then you'd break this uh, OR gate here into two separate, so charge this five. But that also means you have to break all these ANDs into uh, separate AND gates uh, for your inputs, so that's uh, probably going to double the number of AND gates there. And this is a four input OR gate, uh, which is uh, somewhat more complex and would require even more OR gates. So just by that raw count, though, and sort of uh, trying to be fair in that front, uh, I have four up top and eight below. Uh, if we increase the numbers according to uh, this need to multiply for multi-inputs, uh, then I think it's just gonna get worse. And so if you're counting gates, uh, then clearly the top one has fewer gates. Whether or not that's better, uh, I think becomes obvious if you have to pay for the gates, as in if each AND gate you have to buy, uh, this costs you some money. Uh, then you're definitely going to favor the version up top that requires less purchasing uh, associated with uh, acquiring those gates. The other thing that you might look at in terms of gates uh, is just how many different kinds of gates you need. Up here I needed two kinds. I've got AND gates and OR gates, but I need to add in uh, NOT gates down here as well to facilitate this third circuit. Essentially, I'm uh, asking here for all three ANDs um, uh, that would, uh, on this top gate, uh, give me an output if all three are true, uh, but uh, have some additional sort of checks here to see like, well, if only two out of three are true, as in uh, A, B, but not C uh, is true, uh, then this AND gate will feed out a one, versus A and C are true, but B is not true, this middle gate uh, will feed out an one due to the inversion here. Uh, so that necessity of having a NOT gate means uh, I'll have to visit uh, more uh, lanes in the gate shopping mall, uh, the AND lane, the OR lane, and then also the NOT lane down here. So if the types of gates required are needed, it still seems that this first circuit is ahead in that front. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is this notion of a depth of a gate, and this is going to become more and more important as we move ahead. Uh, it'll be the case that as uh, some voltage passes through a gate in electrical circuits, there's a delay uh, as the gate sort of resolves what its output should be uh, and then passes along this wire. There'll be a second delay as that output passes through this second gate over here. In terms of the distance, in terms of the gates that you need to traverse, uh, the maximum number between the inputs here uh, and the output majority over here, for this first circuit, it's just one, or sorry, it's just two, uh, as in all of the inputs pass through an AND gate and an OR gate. Uh, if you were to multiply that out, you might see a second OR gate over here, but for the moment, we'll just call it two. Versus down here, the maximum distance uh, is actually three. Well, you see some, in some cases, I have the same depth of A, B, and C going through this AND and then through an OR. Uh, in some cases here, uh, there's a NOT gate that must be traversed as well. To that end, it's uh, the case that this circuit on the bottom, B, uh, can be thought of to some extent as a little bit slower, uh, that I have to wait one time unit uh, for the maximum uh, number of gates that's traversed uh, in order to uh, ensure that the output here is correctly resolved, uh, then this is worse because I'll have to wait for three time units. And that'll be exactly the case uh, that we see as we start to construct circuits that have a notion of time in it. But for the moment, uh, don't worry about it too much. Uh, that gate depth will come back to haunt us later. So with all that in mind then, uh, there one might be sort of left wondering what is good about this blower gate uh, versus this clever one. Uh, and for that, I'd make a brief sort of allusion to its scalability might be a little bit uh, better. Uh, on that front, one would have to consider if you wanted to extend this circuit not to just the majority of three, but to the majority of five or the majority of nine or the a majority of 111, how would you adapt these circuits to do that? The first case up here, A, is maybe a little bit less obvious uh, and that would take some real thinking uh, to sort of understand how is it that I could adapt the tactic that's used here uh, in order to get this output that I'm interested in because I can't just wire a bunch of AND gates uh, together in this case because a single not, uh, a single off in this case will cause any of these to go off. 
Versus down here, there's a fairly obvious uh, approach that if I wanted to go to four, I'd add another AND gate down here. I'd uh, link up the inputs uh, for all of these into that. And I'd probably have to double this in size uh, with appropriate single knots and double knots uh, going into AND gates there. But it isn't a big sort of you know, change in logic. That Okay, I'm looking essentially for a brute force of any case in which there is one input that's false or any case in which uh, at four inputs there are two inputs that are false. This is still a majority of, of stuff that is uh, uh, true. Uh, extending that to five would involve a lot more gapes and a lot more wires, but the uh, extension is fairly natural, uh, just sort of expensive in terms of gate count, not in terms of human thinking. Uh, so to that end, uh, the algorithm sort of outlined in circuitry here is relatively adaptable and understandable, uh, if not exactly scalable in that front. So uh, we, this is not a hardware design class, but this is the kind of stuff that you would probably discuss ad nauseum uh, in any sort of sequence where you were doing electrical circuit design, such as in an electrical engineering curriculum. Uh, and it would become important to talk about optimizing circuits so that you're using as few components and as little real estate as possible. More gates, uh, as is the case down here, and more wires means more space on your chip uh, that you can't devote to other things, uh, the features of hardware, as it were. Uh, so to that end, the optimization aspect of this is uh, both interesting and difficult. The first practical circuit that we're going to talk about that actually does work, aside from this uh, majority computation, uh, is I think the most important and representative, uh, which is to, do, is to do addition. All of you are familiar that assembly level languages have an addition component to them, uh, that somehow processors are able to take two multi-bit numbers and add them together to get a sum. In fact, this is the original reason that computers were invented, is to spare people of having to do uh, arithmetic sums. To that end, we'll start simple with two gates here. And I'll remind you, uh, this OR with the little bar beneath it that's curved, uh, that's an XOR gate. And beneath it is an AND gate. And the two of them strung together in the following way are referred to as a half adder. Uh, you would see this if you computed the truth table for the two outputs over here, S and C. Uh, you'd find that for inputs of 0 and 0, uh, the S bit that comes out here is a zero, and the carrier bit C is a zero as well. If you had a one and a zero, then by virtue of the exclusive OR here, a one and a zero, or a zero and a one, what comes out here is uh, a one. And what would come out of the AND gate here is a zero. Uh, so for either a one zero or a zero one, the sum over here S uh, is a one, and the carry bit is a zero. But if you have a one and a one, by virtue of that exclusive OR then, uh, I get a zero out here, and it's only in this case that the C bit is a one as well. Uh, so the names S and C are sum and carry because uh, essentially if you're adding two one-bit numbers, uh, a one and a zero and a zero and a one, your sum of that uh, is a, a one, uh, but you have no carry. But if you add a one and a one, you can't actually fit the sum of that You've already, uh, in your sum bit. You've already overflowed this one-bit adder, uh, so it comes out in the carry bit instead. Uh, so to that end, these half adders usually are not used uh, in isolation. Instead, what you want is a full adder, which is going to make it possible uh, to construct uh, sequences of adders as they come together. So we'll take this little pattern over here, which is an XOR gate and an AND gate, and we'll add some additional stuff onto it. Uh, the first thing I want to point out on that front uh, is that I still have this A and B uh, down here, uh, and the inputs are still hooked up to an XOR gate, uh, and they're both also duplicated to an AND gate down here. The additional element that I'm going to add in here is a so-called carry-in bit. And what we'll see is that this ripples out so that I can string several adders together, and as I would sum two ones together and that carries out, it'll become the carry-in to another one. Uh, but just for a moment, uh, if you consider this uh, A, B, and uh, the S and C out here, the truth table is still identical. For a one and a one, uh, what's going to come in here uh, for a carry of zero uh, is a one on the output. Uh, if, sorry, it's a one and a zero or a zero and a one. What comes out here is a one, and what comes out in the carry is uh, a zero. Or, uh, but if I have a 1 and 1 in here, then my sum is going to be a 1, and down here my carry is a 1. 
If you get some additional inputs here, as you'll see in a second, comes from other uh, full adders, uh, then it's essentially like the carry table that you have as you start adding things together. And we'll draw that analogy in just a moment when we get uh, these links of full adders uh, together. So with that in mind, let's string a few of these together uh, to do some proper multi-bit arithmetic. Uh, what you see up here on the right hand side is several of those full adders strung together. Uh, that I have a full adder here and then it's connected in some way to another full adder and connected in again another way to another full adder and finally a third full adder. Uh, essentially these four together allow me to add four bit numbers together and the numbers would come in as bit uh, zero of uh, number A and bit zero of number B, along with bit one of number A and bit one of number B, bit two and bit three of number A, and bit two and bit three of number B uh, for the appropriate adders. The carries here will usually feed in a zero to begin with, but you'll see down here that the out carry for this thing gets fed in as the carry in for the next thing. And this is to replicate, uh, I'll pull up a text editor so to demonstrate this quick, to replicate uh, and adding uh, sort of uh, semantics that you guys are relatively familiar with. Suppose I have two four uh, bit numbers, here's uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, uh, and I'm going to add on to it uh, this uh, 1, 1, 0, 1, uh, something like that. Uh, and I do the addition here uh, along the following lines. So the 1 and the 1 together, uh, their sum is a 0 down here. Uh, but I need to, according to those rules, carry this forwards uh, to the next uh, addition. And that will be done via the one and the one up here in this circuit. Uh, they will cause uh, the output for this thing down here, the sum, to be a zero. But the carry, uh, the one that's computed and goes through these AND gates, uh, that comes in as the carry in for the next uh, a full adder that's down here. Uh, and that's that one up here that's carrying in. Uh, so despite the A and the B here having zeros, and uh, that'll be combined once again with uh, the carry bits that's coming out of this thing and into this thing, uh, so to get a one in the output down here. Uh, so to get a one out here. Uh, and that will be reflected in this out one down here uh, carrying a value of one. As that continues on, uh, for instance, the one and one here, uh, that would produce a zero uh, and get me a carry bit uh, over here uh, for the last one. Uh, and that one and the one that's coming in the input, so that would be a zero for A and a one for B and a one for this carry in, so these carries up here, uh, then that would cause the output here uh, to be XOR together uh, to get a zero and then I have one additional bit that can't fit in those four um, bit widths. Uh, that's the carry out that's down here, indicating that I overflowed, uh, which shouldn't be surprising here. I'm pretty close to the max value uh, in terms of what you can represent with four uh, bit numbers. Uh, and if I add on a sizable chunk here, uh, then I get uh, a carry out there. Now, all that to say then, uh, that we have now a circuit that computes something semi-interesting. Uh, this full bit adder is of use. Uh, to that end, if you string several of those full bit adders together, oftentimes done uh, with block diagrams like this, uh, then you can start to compute 4-bit numbers, and stringing 32 or 64 bits of these, uh, versions of these together, uh, and connecting them in the way that's illustrated in the diagram here, gets you 32 and 64 bits uh, um, adding, uh, just sort of according to the way that you would expect. Uh, this is essentially how the arithmetic logic unit in most modern processors uh, implements addition, is using a circuit like this, albeit with more connections and more gates uh, to facilitate that. Uh, you can see then that there's some interesting properties that we'd want to draw in from our discussion earlier of evaluations, that we need uh, several kinds of gates here, uh, XORs, ANDs, and ORs, according to this, uh, and you also need a fairly long path uh, through this uh, circuitry before you can actually get a resolution uh, to uh, the output being correct. Importantly, uh, you'll see that the, some of the outputs here are immediate, that uh, in order for me to compute the first output here, uh, the, the lowest order sum bit, uh, it's a very direct like, okay, some things come in and they go through a couple gates and I get an output here. Uh, but in order for me to see the output down here, uh, I'll have to wait for uh, the carry to come out of this thing to be carried through here and its carry to come out and go through and the carry here to come out and to go through. Uh, and 
it's only at that point that after waiting for the electrical voltages to resolve through all of that chain of gates, can I really trust uh, this final carry out bit, uh, which would indicate that I overflow uh, in terms of arithmetic uh, or am I still in bounds in terms of the bit width of four here that I'm on. This explains then the notion of uh, how CPUs are going to have delays for certain operations. Uh, they're relatively short and oftentimes tuned to addition so that you can do those things in a single cycle. But a more complex operation that involves more gates, and this would be something like multiplication or division, is going to have a longer delay as signal propagates through those gates, uh, therefore uh, creating a longer wait for the instructions that make use of those gates to actually complete. Uh, it's at that point then uh, that you'd want to have machinery in the CPU that would know to wait for the correct duration for an operation to complete. Uh, knowing that any moments that you're waiting on one operation to complete, you can't be doing other things, uh, which is going to hurt efficiency somewhat. That will conclude our discussion for the moment. Uh, next time we'll pick up discussing another major kind of circuit that will be of import, uh, the kind of circuits known as a multiplexer that allows you to make choices of a bunch of inputs are coming in and I want to select exactly one of those inputs to come out based on some selection bits. Tune in next Monday uh, for that discussion to commence, uh, and hopefully I'll see you guys online for discussion of this material tomorrow. Cheers.